I'm Marilyn McFarland, and I'm the Senior Director of Alumni and Field Relations here at Principia. And we're just so happy that everybody is with us today. And it's fun to get to see your faces. We know many of you are joining join us for the virtual events. Um, and it's fun to get to see you all. We are thrilled that you're a part of this April Book Club talk with Linda Conorati on the book, The Night Portrait by Laura Morelli. And you'll see that our format again is a little bit different from some of our book clubs in the past and other events that we get to see you all. And we're hosting this as a Zoom meeting, which then gives us the opportunity to have breakout discussion groups following Linda's talk. And don't worry, if you didn't have a chance to read the book, you are still welcome to join the discussion group and, and hear what other people have to share. And you're welcome to share what you're currently reading. And maybe then you'll want to pick up the book after. We have a couple of upcoming events I want to make sure you have on your calendar. On this Saturday, May 1st, you can gather all those youngsters in your life, or just for those of you young at heart, and build a fort and be a part of our fortnight. So whether you are building it out of blankets inside, that's what I'm opting for, or outside with leaves and sticks, we're inviting families and friends to join us for a fun evening with games and trivia and lots more on Saturday at 6.30 for Fortnite. And that's gonna be led by our outdoor learning coordinator, Doug Hoff. Then on May, on May 11th, we have a very special concert entitled A Celebration of Love. And that will include performances by Principia alumni, Ashley and Lindsay Gerritsen and Principia faculty emerita and lifelong learning faculty member, Dr. Marie Juriet Beamish. So that will be on Tuesday, May 11th, and there will be more information to come with that. We're really excited to announce our May Book Club pick, and Linda will be leading the discussion again, and it's on Jojo Moy's book, The Giver of Stars. So we hope that you'll join us in May for that book club pick on Tuesday, May 25th. In June, we are going to have an incredible offering of Principia Lifelong Learning courses as part of our mini summer session online. We will miss seeing so many of you in person for summer session this year since we aren't able to gather together in person, but instead we're taking it online and doing a large variety of classes from Bible to music and lots more history and art history. Um, and as well as then just some fun times for summer sessioners to get together um, for some social activities some virtual social activities. So look forward to, to hearing lots more about this, but just wanted you to know that that is coming up in June and it will be all throughout the month of June. So stay tuned for more information. Before I turn the screen over, I just wanna make sure that everyone knows a little bit about our speaker. Linda Conradi is a graduate of Principia College with a degree in English and education. She has a master's degree in liberal arts from Washington University in St. Louis. She worked at Principia for a number of years, serving in a variety of positions from editor of publications to researcher for Principia's centennial history book. Linda loves fascinating conversations surrounding books as we have experienced over the last year. And she has led those conversations as a member of the faculty for a summer session and for several years, including a Principia Lifelong Learning trip to Montreal in 2018. Linda is joining us today from her home in Duluth, Minnesota. Following Linda's talk, we will be splitting into breakout rooms, as I mentioned, for about 20 minutes for each of you to share your insights on the book or to hear other people's insights and share about what you're loving to, to read. Linda will be prompting us with discussion questions for those breakout groups. Following the breakout sessions, we'll come back for just a few more minutes for remarks from Linda. She's going to jump around into the different breakout rooms um, throughout our time together. And we invite you to submit any questions that you have in the chat box at the bottom of the screen where you've entered where you're joining us from. So we are recording this talk and we'll have it available in the next couple of days on our virtual event events webpage where you can see recordings of talks over the last 11 months. So we hope that you will tune in to our upcoming events and view the recordings from some of our past talks. So Linda, I will now turn it over to you.
Thank you, Marilee. And welcome, everybody. I hope you've had as much fun with this book as I have. I am going to start by making a comparison with um, trying a new recipe. So uh, let's say that um, this book is a little bit like gathering ingredients for a new recipe. Let's start with a Da Vinci portrait known as Lady with an Ermine and its painter, Leonardo da Vinci. And the subject of the painting, Cecilia Gallerani. Then let's blend in Edith, a conflicted art conservator, vast and ruthless World War II Nazi art theft, Dominic, a charming American soldier, and two timelines from the 1490s and the 1940s. So blend all these ingredients together and you come up with a dish of which I know I simply can't get enough. I think, I hope you like it as well. Fair comparison, maybe a stretch. By the way, I know that many of you listen to the audio version of this book and you have the German pronunciation of the names. Since I, um, spent most of my time with the print copy, I'm going to stick with the standard American pronunciation of names. So I hope that those of you who only know it in the audio can make that kind of quick transition in your heads. Um, the Night Portrait. Laura Morelli, art historian and storyteller. In this book, she skillfully blends stories told from different viewpoints but often linked by the repetition of the same thought in different voices and connecting chapters. And I hope you were as delighted as I was when you picked up on those um, linking you from one chapter to another, usually from you know the 500 years ago to the present. And it was a line that was relevant to both time periods. Very cleverly, um, clever use of blending stories, I thought. Um, but before we get into the specifics of this story, sometimes people ask me about how I chose the book and why. And um, so I want to just take a couple of minutes to sort of share my, my quick history over the last four months with this book. Um, I asked my questions, why, why is this book worth reading? And so here are some of my, my thoughts on that. There are some universal characteristics portrayed, both good and evil. There's a reverence for art and its place in our lives. We have obedience to duty. We see lasting effects of war. We see sacrifice and fear and hope and wrestling with one's conscience, with one's conscience over choices made. So as we read, we're given insights into history, although woven into a fictional story. And I think if you come away from this book, reflecting on your own preferences for and appreciation of art, or thinking about your own experiences or those of relatives of, or friends who have served in the military, sometimes under dangerous conditions. Then by reading this book, you have enriched your life, expanded the borders of your tent, so to speak. So this book holds up many mirrors to us. It was recommended to me by friends at Christmas time who actually said, this might be a book you'd like to consider for your discussions. They have been to some of the previous discussions. So I read it over the holidays, followed by watching a series of films. Uh, one is a documentary, The Rape of Europa, which is um, a stunning revelation. It is all real footage from World War II with real people in it. You see 
some of the Nazi leaders in real footage. Um, it gives you, it really gives you a view of the scope of the theft of art during World War II, and it's just beautifully done. Then I watched the movie, The Monuments Men, which is very relevant to this story as we have Monuments Men work within this story. And the other movie I watched was Woman in Gold, which is um, about the, about the theft of a, a Klimt portrait of Adele and the ensuing battle for years between the Austrian government and her niece in America who, who eventually got the picture. But there are just so many side stories that come out of the art theft and the restitution and recovery um, of so much of it. So after seeing all of those films, I went back to read, to read the book again. And I listened to some interviews and did, a, did some research. And then I read the book again. So now we're up to three times of reading the book. And I will tell you that first time I read a book, it's pretty much for the story. The second time I begin to pick up on themes and thinking more about the depth of character development and some of the other sort of standard things that we look for in a, in a good book. Third time through, I realized that I was just plain hooked. <laughs> I was just really hooked on this story. Um, I even very recently, as I was just immersed in the book, found myself listening to a conversation between the character Edith and Dominic. But oddly enough, this was not even a conversation in the book. I was dreaming and I was making up the conversation in my dream. Now, it's not very often that books slip into my subconscious or my dream. But I will have to admit to you that this one is not going to be easy um, to forget. And I hope that it has been a memorable journey for you as well. But let's look back at the cover that I've left up here on the uh, screen right now. And we're going to look at this cover twice, but right now I'd like you just to look at the banner that goes across the bottom because the title, The Night Portrait, really didn't tell me anything when somebody told me about this book. And it wasn't until I saw the subtitle, a novel, of World War II and Da Vinci's Italy that I realized it was going to be a pretty complicated story. And then the, the two pictures at the bottom um, show the soldiers carrying some of this art, which had been recovered. And of course, one of the pieces of art, the, um, the lady with the ermine. So it was just, um, well, we'll come back to my other comments about the about the um, cover of the book. Okay, just a second here, let me get this. Okay, now you are looking at a very close up view of the cover of Walter Isaacson's definitive biography on Leonardo da Vinci. And I have included this for two reasons. One is just so that we can talk a little bit about Leonardo. We do not know for sure if this was a self-portrait or a portrait that someone else painted. And yet it gives you a glimpse of Leonardo. And also, if it was not a self-portrait, someone else did a very good job of looking into his soul through his eyes, which um, is something that Leonardo began to do in his paintings, particularly with the lady with the ermine. Um, At the time of this painting, Leonardo had just come to Milan. He was still a fairly young man and he was still trying to market himself as um, an engineer and he wanted to build war machines and um, a lot of other things that had never been done. And yet the Duke of Milan who had hired him, Ludovico Sforza, hired him actually to be in the court and he wanted him to paint um, kind of it was actually it turned out he painted more than one mistress but he painted Cecilia 
the mistress at the moment. And um, we, are we are given, in Leonardo's voice in this book, I think we are given kind of an interesting view of what goes on in the courts, um, in, the, in, the, in the castle, in Milan. And we also see Cecilia's role as an entertainer. She was a very learned young woman. She loved poetry and music. She could sing. And um, Ludovico had her entertain many of his guests. We also see her friendship with Leonardo, which she really cherished. And he did as well as, as, he, as she sat for him. Now we are looking at the painting itself. And um, I think one of the first things that jumps out at you from this painting is that strange creature she's holding in her arms. She, uh, doing a little bit of research about this and why it's called an ermine, I found out that um, in his drawings, Leonardo had drawn kind of mythical creatures that looked something like this. Only this is bigger than a real ermine, but part of part of the story is that the ermine represented purity, because in the winter time when his coat turns white, it would rather die than soil itself, and um, also, apparently, um, Ludovico had been given the honor of. Um, he was a member of the Order of the Ermine in 1488. He was appointed by Ferdinand I to um, have this honor. So the, so the ermine had um, significance. It also apparently relates to um, being thought of as an animal that pr sometimes protected pregnant women. And at the time Cecilia was sitting for this portrait, she was pregnant with Ludovico's um, child with his son. But if you look at the way she is sitting in this paint in this portrait too. It, at first, I honestly didn't realize why it seemed like such an awkward pose to me, because her body is turned sort of toward your left, and yet in this painting, her attention suddenly goes to her right or to the other side, and she's looking over her left shoulder to someone who maybe has entered the room. Maybe it's. Um, Ludovico. And there's a sort of slight smile that is playing around her mouth, which if you look closer at the Mona Lisa, you may see a similar smile. And the Mona Lisa was painted uh, after, after this one, several years after. And, and by the way, Leonardo worked on the Mona Lisa like for almost 20 years, for the last 20 years of his life. But notice also how the ermine seems to have snapped its head in the same direction. It, it's almost like a, a mirror image of what Cecilia is doing. So um, in Isaacson's book, he has quite a lengthy description of this painting. He said it's his favorite painting of Leonardo's, but he says something is happening in the scene Leonardo has captured a narrative contained in an instant, one involving outward lives and inner lives. He says, in the medley of hands, paws, eyes, and a mysterious smile, we see both motions of the body and motions of the mind. And he concludes by saying, as Leonardo portrayed the motions of her mind and soul, he played with our own inner thoughts in a way that no portrait had done before. Well, after I studied that description, this painting truly came alive to me. And um, I, you almost could see uh, the motion of her turning her head to paying attention to whatever had just, whoever had just entered the room. So that's kind of fun. And because this painting um, is such an important part of our story, I thought, I thought it would be fun to um, spend a little bit of time on it. Now you are looking at um, another chapter in Isaacson's book. This is 
two of a four page spread of a timeline. And he, I put it in here because um, 14, it, it says about 1493, this paint was, painting was thought to have been painted between 89 and 91. But the red, the red dots are art. Um, the world is the blue, the blue banner that goes across the middle of it. it tells what's going on in the world. And um, you, you, you realize that Christopher Columbus is, is, um, is discovering the new world about this time. So it gives you a sense of what we're talking about. But the, um, the kind of yellow orange one um, represents periods of his life. And then the green one, there's only one dot on this two page spread of green, but there are more on the following pages um, are science. And those are some of the drawings. If you're interested in learning more about Leonardo's life, I, I highly recommend Isaacson's book and a book of Leonardo's note, notebook, his notebooks. And there are several different versions, but they many of them have wonderful, wonderful drawings. From, from his life. And to me, they show a lot of the qualities and characteristics he had within him that enabled him to see what he saw in Cecilia when, when, he, was, when he was painting her. So I've, I've stepped back again to um, this, portrait because now I want to talk about the person who is we only see her back. But first of all, as we as we visit each of the main characters, Leonardo and Cecilia, Edith and Dominic, you might want to think about what were your impressions of them and did you have a favorite character? This would be a good question to take into your breakout rooms. But to, to go back to the cover of the book, why do we just see the back view of this person? And do you think it's Edith? So um, I know you're not going to have time to answer all of these questions, but if you're, if you're jotting down any notes, this, these are some kind of fun ones to jump off on. Let's talk a little bit about Edith. You know, we move back and forth in these timelines from the, the stories of Leonardo's time and the time of the painting and, and uh, Cecilia, and then to the 1940s, when this Nazi campaign to steal all of the art in Europe was beginning to gear up. And our Edith was a very quiet, kind of shy art conservator in one of the big museums in Munich. And she was very good. And uh, she knew a lot about art, which brought her to the attention of the higher ups and how she was asked to um, create lists of art and where it was. But when she realizes what she has done, she knows that to speak out against it, as she finally realizes they're going to head set out to steal all of these collections of art. She also knows that her life would be in peril. She's warned very quickly not to say anything. Um, you know, this is, this is a terrible time in our world history. And Edith was just a regular person, but she got conscripted by the Nazis to do this, to be, to be one of their um, helpers. This was the time when Hitler began to campaign to eradicate um, the Jewish people and their culture and anything connected with it. And it was a horror so heinous that even today people are reluctant to talk about it. And so we have Edith in this uh, background and of course it wasn't right away 
that people began to hear about the extermination of the Jewish people in the camps, but it began, it began to become apparent that this was happening. So it was um, not an easy time to be an art conservator, and especially since she suddenly was working for the Fuhrer. And he wanted all of this art for, the, he envisioned his Fuhrer Museum um, to be the museum for all of Europe. And also the Nazi officers were helping themselves to whatever they wanted as they were selecting the art for his museum. And in, in the documentary, The Rape of Europa, you see Goering um, featured, he actually made many visits to the museums in Paris during the time that they were, that they were beginning to take all of the art. But Edith keeps her private inventory of art and where it is going. And by doing this, she's risking her own life. If this is discovered, she would probably be shot. But when she realizes what she's done, it seems like the rest of the book, we feel she's trying to do the right thing. She wants to find ways to eventually return all the stolen art to the rightful owners. So Morelli creates in Edith a character who wrestles with her conscience as she secretly tracks this art and its hidden destinations. So again, I, I would say, what is your take on Edith and uh, her role in this story? And also one, one of the questions that um, Laura Morelli likes to ask is, and what would you do if you were in a similar situation? That really takes you to another level in the book, but, but really worthy of discussion, I think. Their, vicar Stephanie is um, a German uh, vicar in the church and he is actually found in a bombed out church and he kind of attaches himself to the monuments men. And he, in a conversation with Dominic, the young soldier says, imagine a world without art, without music, dancing, without the things we do not really need it would not be a world worth living in. So here are the monuments men at the end of the war and they have um, begun to take the treasures from mines and vaults and uh, churches or places, wherever, wherever castles, wherever it had been hidden. And these are three of the monuments men with the Polish officer who's accepting the painting back from, from the monuments men for Poland. And um, I think this is just such a striking image of how real this was. And also how amazing it is that our author has been able to blend real history with fiction. And in an interview, she said that um, if you don't know a lot about the real history and the real characters, that's where the fun begins for her because her imagination creates the characters and the stories that fill in the spaces. And uh, this is really so true. Well, let's talk for a few minutes about Dominic, who's one of our other um, narrators in this story. And we see much of the war through his eyes. He survives landing in Normandy and he's on the front line. He apparently is, he kills many people. He survives, but his best friend, Paul, who recognizes Dominic as an artist, dies in front of him and, and Paul's final words to Dominic are keep drawing, a theme which resonates throughout the entire book. Dominic loves art 
and he sketches every time he can. But he dreams of getting back to the States and his young wife and two daughters, just tiny children. But the story to me really gets interesting. When he is, he's assigned to security for the monuments men toward the end of the war. And he sees firsthand the staggering stashes of art and gold and jewelry and so much more hidden away in mines and castles and bank vaults, um, recovered as far as they were able to do so under very perilous conditions. And throughout this whole mission, Dominic wrestles with choices to save art versus human life. He, he finally does come to accept that art is worth saving, but that quote that I just gave you from Stefan Vickeny, Steph, Vicker Stephanie, I got his name backwards. Um, that was at the end of a long conversation that they had had when they realized what was being recovered. This is a quote that talks about Dominic's um, conception of, of this whole thing. He was surrounded by orderly rows of inexpressible beauty. This is when he was looking at all of this art. Each piece, a testimony to the value of the human spirit that had created it. An example of how humanity was determined to bring light and beauty into a world that had fallen into inconceivable darkness. This world was not the this world war was not the first tragedy to strike mankind, and it would not be the last. Just a second. But I can't, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm covered up here. None of the, something had been able to destroy humanity's appreciation um, for beauty. It was the only thing that gave Dominic hope. And the sense of his hope um, keeps appearing, keeps appearing throughout the story in spite of the unbelievable conditions with which these people were living. I have, I have another um, quote that I want to share with you before we go, before we go on to the next slide. At, at the end of the book, Laura Morelli has a wonderful compendium of resources for further study on all of the different topics she covers in this book. But one of the, one of the uh, things that I found so interesting was she had a, a question and answer session with Robert Edsel, who, wrote so much about the Monuments Men. He was also the co-producer of that documentary. And he, um, it was his writing that led to the movie, The Monuments Men, the, the 2014 movie that uh, George Clooney did. And she asks, Laura Morelli asks Edsel this question. Of the staggering number of works of art stolen by the Nazis, what was special about da Vinci's portrait of Cecilia Gallerani? What do you think made this picture such an object of desire? And Edsel responds, what distinguished the Nazi looting operation was the degree of planning and dedication of resources. German art history historians created lists of works of art that were targeted for theft prior to the invasion of each nation. And then he goes on to say, with just 16 or so fully accepted works by the Renaissance master, ownership of Leonardo's Lady with an Ermine would have conferred the greatness Hitler envisioned for his Führer Museum. To me, perhaps the most thrilling chapter of the book comes with Edith's chance encounter on an Austrian hillside with Dominic. 
I will not describe this because um, I don't want to just give away the whole story. But um, to me, it's a turning point in this story and it starts to tie together the threads of all of the stories that you have read so far. Now, um, I would like to just pose a couple more questions for you before we head to the um, breakout rooms. And also remind you that in the back of the book, there are some really lovely discussion questions um, from the author. And I hope those of you who are in book groups have um, gotten into these questions. But I've only put three up here. Which character story did you find most compelling and why? By the way, these are not from her list. These are some that I've been thinking about. What would you do if you found yourself in a similar situation? That was her recommendation. Also, I'd like to know, what did you think of the structure of the story with the two timelines and alternating narrators? How, did, how well did that work for you? And then this question, what will resonate with you long after you finish the book? In other words, what is your takeaway? And now we're going to take you away to your breakout rooms. Marilee? Great, Linda, well, well, I think people are just joining back, but we'll let you say a few closing words and- Okay, I have, um, I think that I, um, I, I didn't do my final slide, which was just a short list of recommendations beyond the book, but I think I mentioned all of them in my, um, in my talk itself, but as a, as a closing comment, I'm going to tell you, I asked myself the same question about my takeaway. And here, here is what I said. After reading the book, oh, okay, there it is. Marilee put it up. Um, that was, that was um, the only one that I hadn't mentioned was um, about the Smithsonian article. Okay, but my takeaway from this book, after reading it and um, thinking about the scope of history that it encompasses, I found myself asking the question, when do our better angels prevail? How do we decide on pursuing higher goals for the greater good? What risks are we willing to take to do this? Okay, I'll, I'll say this again because they're kind of, they take you a, a, le a level deeper. When do our better angels prevail? How do we decide on pursuing higher goals for the greater good? In other words, like Edith tried to do. And then what risks are we willing to take to do this? Well, this book prompted me to look deeper inside my own heart and consciousness and to acknowledge a desire to listen to my better angels as I think about challenges and choices. So I'd like to give a shout out to our author. Thanks to Laura Morelli for her gift of this book, The Night Portrait. And also a big thank you to Principia's Alumni and Field Relations for hosting the program. Um, I thank you all for coming and I hope you'll continue this conversation with your friends as, as you go. And for those of you who haven't yet read the book, you are in for a huge treat. So thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thank you all so much. Thanks for being a part of it. We look forward to seeing you at our upcoming events with Fortnite or the music concert on May 11th, and then join in reading Jojo Moy's The Giver of Stars. Um, if you haven't had a chance to read that yet, I just finished it and really enjoyed the story. And then in June, look forward to seeing everyone as part of the summer session online. So have a lovely rest of your day. Linda is giving this talk again tonight at 7 p.m. So if you'd like to join again and be a part of those discussion groups or have any family or friends that would like to join, please encourage them to do so. Thanks so much, and we will see you soon. Bye-bye.